not going to ask for a show of hands, but think about it. Are you bothered in any way about that gospel and that parable Jesus told? And here I will ask a show of hands. How many here thought, man, those people out there all day, they got the shaft, you know? Uh, they deserve to get more pay. After all, they had a legitimate gripe. How many think, agree with that? They agree that that can be right. Okay, a lot of the others don't want to say anything because Jesus told a parable and you don't want to be on the wrong side of this story, right? Yeah, no, it is interesting to reflect upon and especially if we take it literally in our own day in terms of work, we, uh, we could be bothered. On the other hand, we remember parables are maybe as we reflect upon them to give us a deeper insight into God and how we are with one another. So we know that uh, in, in that reading, the landowner, after they all gripe because they feel, it's, it's conventional wisdom, I get it. They feel, if you work more, you deserve to get more, more, more pay. And so they were coming from that. And as the story goes, the landowner, remember, think, and one image of God was basically saying to them, hey, I told you, I gave you what I told you. Can't you be content with that? I am just and I am generous. Are you upset? Are you envious because I'm generous? Because somehow you think you ought to get more and these other people don't matter. And, and looking at that too, in terms of why the landowner did what he did. I mean, he was just to everybody, but probably one of the reflections, again, think of God as an image. One of the reflections is that landowner had mercy and compassion, and for starters, all even the ones who came at five o'clock, they had been there all day. They were day laborers. They were trying to get work probably to feed their family and, and take care of the people important to them. They weren't just lying around and just not even showing up. And so the landowner, God in some way, is, is out there and says, hey, I have compassion for them. You know, they were here all day, and they have needs too. They come to this day laboring in order to uh, help take care of their family, uh, feed the people, uh, you know, wanting to have something because they're barely getting by as a day laborer, and makes that point. And again, that sense that uh, the danger of comparing ourselves, well, but we've done all this, so God, you should be generous to us. We righteously have this. No way then. And, and God, remember, in that first reading from Isaiah, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your way is not my way. His way, coming forth from that, even that parable, is, hey, I want to reach out to everyone. I'm not going to measure them this way or that way and say, not going to bother with you. And as, as we see that, too, uh, we see that uh, we need to better understand, okay, God, what are you trying to tell us through this? What do we need to hear? Maybe we're not getting it right. We all can tend to think about God and about a lot of other situations. We got it all right. We got the mind of God. We know who he loves, who he doesn't, who he judges and, and, and who he doesn't, who's on the in, who's on the out. We can get caught up in that. And that's where, again, we need to remember God saying, my, uh, my ways are not your ways. First of all, my way is that generous and inclusive and loving and reaching out to any human being in need. And as we, as we look at that situation, we can also see this very clearly. And we've all heard it, and we need to hear it again. Basically, what's being said out of that parable is God's love is not something we earn. It's not something we say, I did A, B, and C, so God, I know you care about me, not those people. God's love ultimately revealed in Jesus pouring out his heart is gift. Gift for the sake of everyone. And, and can we appreciate that and, and, and realize that and, and experience that? And we know that uh, when we come here, we ought to be experiencing that sense of God's love that is so generous that touches us and we bring it to others. In fact, uh, uh, the American bishops over the last year or so have talked about what they're naming uh, Eucharistic revival. Basically, what they're trying to say is, and, and for us to deepen it, that when we come here and worship, 
And we center ourselves in, in God's presence in his word and feeding us his very life. That we, that, that ought to touch our lives. That ought to make a difference in us. I know uh, I've often talked to people on retreats where we've emphasized this, where people have more time to hear God speaking and touch their hearts and souls. And, and one fellow, I remember putting it this way, he said, Father, for years I came to church and I just basically went through the motions. I experienced it as an obligation. That's what I saw. I, I, I was kind of negative toward other people who didn't fulfill the obligation the way I did. And, 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 you know, until that retreat, he said, I didn't have a sense that, yeah, there can be an obligation, but this is so much more than that. This is our God bringing us together in worship to let us know, to hear his word, so we can get the kind of guidance we need for daily life, to be fed with our deepest hunger, which ultimately is a spiritual hunger, a hunger for deeper meaning and purpose and, and, and sense of life and love. And in some way, to be touched by that, this fella mentioned, he said, you know, I came, went through the motions, and then I'd go home and forget about it for the rest of the week. And obviously, and he saw that on the retreat, to be touched by God here, to be able, hey, God, speak to me in whatever way you need, you need me to hear you. Uh, let me really be open to you, not so much judging everybody else, but saying, what are you trying to say to me? What do I need to hear at this? And, and, and to recognize in that that the Lord not only wants to show his generosity and mercy, so we experience that gift but also that we're touched by that gift in such a way that when we leave here and we go into our daily lives, we can be all the more loving and kind and generous because we've experienced God doing that for us and saying, now go out and do it for others. Not judgment, but out. If, if there's people you feel one way or another, most important thing is not so much to judge, but to pray, to pray for people, to pray that all people can really come to know God's goodness and love making a difference in them. And uh, as I mentioned, the, uh, uh, the bishops of the country, this Eucharistic revival, wanting us to be revived in that deeper sense that the heart of our faith is not, first of all, rules and rituals, that has their place, but it's relationship. And to be revived in that relationship in some way, like this fellow saw from that retreat, to just experience Jesus as somebody real, somebody so self-giving, somebody he admired and could be inspired by and believe in some way this same Jesus is still praying for us. So as we look at this today, maybe all of us uh, can take that moment and go within I know that this whole notion of revival, you know, Andy mentioned last week about uh, going to a revival as he was a young man and being touched by the Lord and giving his life. Well, for me, the kind of revival I had, remember I wasn't Catholic, but I, I, I lived on North Howard Street back then, and there was a church right across the street, a black church, okay? And in the summertime, their windows would be open. They didn't have air conditioning. And you could hear these folks praising and thanking God, and, and you could hear their enthusiasm. And that touched me. And, and, and I'm mindful for all of us that can we be more enthusiastic in our faith? It doesn't mean we need to express it in the same way by shouting and praising, although that's a beautiful expression. But it does mean as we come here each day and each Sunday and we give glory to God even in that opening hymn of praise as we're here, that because what matters most is that in our interior life, there's a revival. Our interior life, a revival that every time somehow helps us to appreciate life as gift to appreciate Jesus as Lord and Savior in this sense, the one who liberates us from sin, sin, the one who shows that love is stronger than death, and there's the victory and resurrection, all of that. Come in here. And maybe one of the greatest moments of revival is when you come forward. You know, a lot of those churches, hey, come on down and accept Jesus. Well, every time we come up here to receive communion, can that be a way in which we say we receive Jesus and say thank you? And somehow, because we're here for the whole Mass and for that, we can at the end, when go in peace, go out there, go out there and live it, that we do it better because of what we've experienced here. And finally, you know, I often say, take a quiet moment, 
take a quiet moment and stop and reflect. We're here. The Lord wants to speak to us, each in our own way. Just take a moment and see if something stirs within you. You don't necessarily have to say it's the voice of God. Maybe it is. But just what, from what we've talked about here from the Scripture and this homily, what do you need to hear? Is there one even little thing to take with you for me to take with me as we go back out of that daily life as followers of Jesus, living his love, his generosity, his mercy, his goodness? Quiet moment. See what's in your heart. God bless you.